Thank you for joining us for our weekly video sermon. We pray you will be blessed by the Word of God. Elementary. Uh, this is not a series that I'm beginning, but, but I would like to do a series on this. In fact, I, I will eventually. And that is on vital truths. I know that you've got a little, uh, in, your, in your bulletin, you see... Uh, what I'm talking about, a little heartbeat that says vital truths. And, and to help you understand it, let's look at it this way. When it comes to my body, there are certain things that are vital. Correct? In other words, I can probably lose a hand. I wouldn't be happy about it, but I could probably live. True. An arm, leg, finger, an eye, an ear, a nose, perhaps even a kidney, or perhaps a lung. But there are certain things that I can't do without, that are vital. A little tickaroo, it's kind of vital, (laughs) you know? Every once in a while, does anybody here ever just do like this? Oh, yeah, good. It's good to feel that thing beating, you know what I mean? It's really good. Anybody ever do this? I mean, you know you're alive because you're alive. But you just want to know that it's got a good rhythm to it. <laughs> That's good. That sounds good. That's vital. Without your heart, probably gone. I mean... The brain's a good thing to have, right? Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Right in it? What was that? I don't even know that word. <laughs> Years ago, I went to EMT school. I was a fireman, and I went to EMT school. You didn't know I was a hero, did you? You thought I was, you thought I was a loser all my life. Well, I really was. It was a volunteer fire, fireman in Maxton, North Carolina. We set fires to have them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just messing, we really did. Well, we did sometimes, but it was controlled. Um, And I went to EMT school, and I had finished, and my first call, as an 18-year-old kid, the first call was a DOA. Y'all know what that means? All right, everybody's familiar with dead on arrival. So, you know... As an 18-year-old, your beeper goes off. You don't even, some of you, how many of you remember the beeper days? Uh, you used to go around and just hit the button just to make people, th- in case you missed the beeper on my side, let me hit the button. <laughs> that squelch would go off and people would look and you say, yeah, I'm a farmer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm revealing my stupidity. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it goes off, you know, and you, you just jump in your car Lights flashing, and you go as fast as you can go. And I get there, and a guy had walking down the road, apparently drunk, had stepped in front of a um, an eighteen wheeler. It was um, it was not a not a fair fight, and we had to pick up from the road vital organs. Vital truths. There are some things that are vital to your survival. Everybody understand that? There are a lot of things that we talk about in church that, in fact, to be honest with you, there are a lot of things that people get hung up on that's not vital. It's just not vital. You can take it away and and the church can keep on going. But yet we spend all of our time... I'm telling you, there are churches all over America today that they're fighting over things that have nothing to do with anything. Whether or not they're going to have a chair or a pew. Whether or not what what color the chair is going to be. I mean, there there are people that leave church and leave God over a chair. over a room, over a building, over a light, whatever it may be. That, I mean, it's just not vital. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And the things that do matter, we overlook those things. 
And, and, and the most vital thing that I really think that we understand is this. What must I do to be saved? Salvation. Oh, pastor, we all know what it means to be saved. I don't think we do. I don't think the church, for the most part, all in America, even begins to have a real clue of what it means to be saved. When we talk about the word salvation in terms of Christianity. Amen? Even the Lord Himself said, not all those that say, Lord, Lord, will enter into His kingdom. In other words, not all of those that say that they're saved are saved. Well, if not everybody that says they're saved are saved, why is not everyone that wants to take the stand and say, I'm saved, why are they not really saved? Because they don't have an understanding of what salvation really is all about. They don't know. And the church assumes that people know this vital truth. But they don't know. They don't know that being saved is not just no longer there. In other words, I'm not what I used to be. Just because I'm not what I used to be doesn't mean that I have a personal relationship with Christ. Does that make sense to you? Let me read this to you this morning. Uh, you guys get ready in the back. I mean, I'm not sure exactly where I'm going to go. So <laughs> that's the worst job in the world back there. I just want to tell you. Y'all may not know that, but, but, uh, but the worst job in the world is being in the back, trying to keep up with a pastor that has no clue what he's going to say next. Acts, the 16th chapter, verses 30 in verse 31. This, this scripture, Acts 16, provides one example of the many adventures and challenges that, that are faced by the early Christian church. What they were overcoming. It, it talks about the preaching of, of Paul and Silas and their persecution and their imprisonment. Um, how many of you want to go to jail because you're a Christian? Well, I didn't, that's not, what I, that's not what I joined up for. Well, our world changes enough. That may be where you're headed. You, you have to count the cost before you get in this thing, okay? Wow, y'all are so silent. Don't be silent on me at this moment. You've got to count the cost. Are you really willing to die for your Savior? It's a, it's a yes or a no. It's an amen or a silence. <laughs> there you go. Y'all are good. Rather than feeling discouraged while in jail, these two Christians prayed. And they sang hymns. Rather than whine and complain, there's another sermon that I'm going to share. Probably on a prayer meeting. By the way, prayer meeting will not be Tuesday night this week. It will be Wednesday night. Everybody remember that. Okay? I'm going to do some change some things up here a little bit. And there's, there's one I'm going to preach on. Complaining. I'm going to share it in a prayer because I think that it's important that after we get through talking about complaining, we have some prayer time. Amen. <laughs> there you go. Y'all are not sure where to take me today. It's okay. It's all right. An earthquake shook the prison. Doors are open. Chains of all the prisoners are loosed. And the jailer, greatly concerned, approached the two, falling before them. And here's what he says. Let's read this. He brought them out and he said, Sirs! Sir! Think about that. He's the jailer. I got some guys in here that are jailers. They watch prisoners. Who's in charge? That wasn't a trick question, guys. The jailer's in charge. So who says yes, sir, no, sir? The prisoner. What changed? This guy says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You 
and your household. Sirs, I know that you used to say sir to me, but there's something changed here. I recognize that you are, you are not just the average person. I recognize that you have a relationship with this Jesus, that you are put in this jail because you serve Him. Sirs, what do I have to do to be like you? What do I have to do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe. Well now, we can can look at that word believe on the Lord Jesus and and think, okay, I believe. Is that it? Well, you got to understand what the word believe is all about. So, So maybe... In looking at this passage, maybe in everyday language, we understand that to be saved or delivered from our fallen condition is just more than just this one word. What does this one word encompass? See, in our understanding of the English language, when we say believe, we can say, oh, okay, I, I, believe, that, uh, I believe that Jesus was. I believe that Jesus lived. I believe that Jesus died. That's all i got to do is just believe it and I'm safe. Well, you got to understand what that word really means in the Greek. That's deeper than just the word believe. There are so many people that believe Jesus lives that they would tell you that they're a Christian simply because, I'm going to break my neck today. Simply because they believe. But it's more than just believing in the context of what this word really means. And see, we don't, we don't dive into the deeper levels of what He's really trying to say to us. Before clarifying salvation in biblical terms, maybe it's helpful to look at the ways of salvation that are not in line with Christian theology. So maybe to understand what Christianity is, we need to understand what Christianity is not. Does that make sense to you? So to understand what it's not, maybe to help us to understand exactly what it is. Probably the most common approach is works-based. Although we say, no, it's by grace, it's not by works. you got so many people that do so many things for the church that they think that that means that they're saved. You can be the hardest worker in this church and not have a relationship with God. In terms of things getting done, you can be doing more than anybody else is doing, but that doesn't mean that you have a relationship with Christ. As the name suggests, this approach to salvation relies on human works and what we can do in order to save ourselves. See, when it comes to salvation, Christianity is Savior-centered. It's not self Centered. That makes sense to you? It's centered in Christ. It's not centered in yourself. You'll be surprised at how many people in church that their whole life is centered around themselves. What I need you to do for me, Jesus. This is what I need. Or this is what I can do. This is what I can bring to the table, Pastor. Excuse me? Yeah, if you get me, this is what you get. Well, probably what I get if I get you with that mindset is a problem. Right? Because you're self-centered. Which everything's about you. Which means I would never able to I would, I would never be able to do enough to satisfy you. Because you, your, your whole approach is give me this, give me that. Bless me, Lord, I pray. Give me what I think I need to make it through the day. Keep me healthy, make me wealthy. Fill in all the rest on my never-ending shopping list. Wow, that's a good song, isn't it? Just made it up. No, I didn't. That's an old song. That's some Christians. We'll write those words out for you so you can put them down and memorize them. Just a a self-centered approach. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man can do what? Boast. So that no man can say, this is who I am. 
You know, there are a lot of pastors that know that they were saved by grace and all of a sudden their salvation went from being saved by grace to nothing but about, but, but about them, who they are. They even think that their churches can't make it without them. There ain't a pastor out there that the church can't make it without him. There's a good one for you to say amen. I'm talking about me. There's not a church out there that can't make it without... Gateway Church will be fine without Jay Young. Say amen. <laughs> Gateway Church would be fine without Jay Young. Gateway, I'm telling you, I'm not going to take it personal. You're not going to offend me. Gateway Church would be fine without Jay Young. Amen. Yeah, it will be. Why? Because it's his church. It's not my church. It's not, about, it's not about us. It's not about what we can do or what we can bring. Th- See, the problem is we start centering our religion in our churches around personalities. We center it around people. We center it around our things. See, that's not salvation. Salvation is, is, is of a personal relationship with a man called Jesus. And the church belongs to Him. And since the church belongs to Him, He is in control of the church. Amen? It's His church. It's not our church. So since it's His, He'll take care of it. It's not around anybody else. Not about anybody else. But we have to understand those simple truths about salvation. See, good works are the natural outcome of following salvation through Christ. Are there works involved in it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I have a personal relationship with Christ, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to serve Him till I die. I'm going to be the best worker that He's ever had. I wasn't saved because of my works, but because I'm saved, look what I do for Him. Because I understand what He did for me on Calvary, and because I understand what He did for me, and because salvation is a personal relationship with Him, that there is no other way that man can go to heaven except through the blood of Jesus. And because He applied that blood to my life, and I have been the recipient of the grace of God, and He saved me and delivered me and set me free, I'll live and serve Him for the rest of my life. I don't do what I do because it's part of my job description. I do it because I'm saved. I'm saved. I honor Him because I'm saved. I bless Him because I'm saved. I worship Him because I'm saved. I give Him glory because I'm saved. I come to church because I'm saved. I read my Bible because I'm saved. I pray to Him because I'm saved. I give my tithes to Him because I'm saved. You get a point? Not saved by works, but... uh, You see, salvation is not found in legalism either. Do this, do that, and you'll be saved. Dress this way, dress this way. Oh, don't put too much makeup on the barn. That was a poor choice of words. I'm sorry. (laughs) I was thinking that all barns need a good paint coat of paint on it. Just leave it alone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Travis is on the front row going. Is, uh, Strict adherence to a list of do's and don'ts is not what Christian salvation is all about. Please, everybody at Gateway Church today, hear me. It's not a list of do's and don'ts. It's not me reading out of a manual and telling you how you got to live. And if you want to be saved, you got to do this and do that. I remember years ago when people used to join the church, they read this, they'd read out of the manual. Do you agree to do this and 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 this? And this? And then, man, I'm sitting there looking back on it now as an adult and I'm thinking, how did anybody join the church? Most of them joined it lying to begin with. It's easier to go to heaven than it is to join some churches. To go to heaven, you've got to be saved. The, the, the blood of the Lamb has to be applied to your life. And if you've been saved, man, you're heaven bound. But that doesn't mean you're a member of our church. You're going to have to quit doing this and quit doing that and do this and do this and do this and dress like this and walk like this and talk like this. And, 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 
Good Lord, thank God He's delivered us from that. I want you to know, if you're new to our church, that's not what you're a part of, and you ought to say hallelujah. And all those that are, you'll just pray for them. Don't condemn them, just pray for them. Just pray for them. Romans 3.20 reads, No one will be declared righteous in His, in God's sights, by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. In other words, the law can't save you. We just got through with Romans. The law can't save you. No more than our rules and our regulations will save you. So if you think that you're abiding by some rules, that that makes you safe, you... Oh, I've got some sad news for you. You are not safe. Well, I've been, I've been going by them there rules that the church had all my life. That doesn't mean you're safe, friend. Romans just declared that. You're not saved through the, through, through the law and, and what other people with, may, may tell you that you have to do. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. What that law does is it, it just simply checks us and says, you know what, this is the way that you need to live. So it condemns us. And it lets us know we need what? We need to be saved. Just like these glasses need to be rescued. From my hand. Y'all know, what's going to happen to these glasses within a week or two? Yeah. Okay? So you can come and rescue them from my hands. But that don't mean they're saved. Alright? They're just rescued from my hands. And no more than they're saved, some people are saved. Because they think that they have done this and done this, and done this, that they're saved, but they're, they're not. i got, I got to move on real, real quickly here. So, some beliefs claim that salvation in a biblical sense is not required. Instead, terms such as, oh, I love this, or oh, I hate this, whatever the word is, spiritual liberation, or, I'll, I'll dig this word, dig this word, Now I'm going to the 60s. Enlightenment. I've I've been enlightened. And you're still stupid. (laughs) Kids are not in here. I can use that word. Enlightened. (laughs) Most of the time, it's found in, in variations of Eastern world views such as pantheism, but, but yet, if you don't see it, Eastern worldviews have now crept into America. And in and, and our efforts to embrace, and can I tell you something? Be real careful who you hug. Man, all my front row people. Come on, Travis. Come on, come on, give you a hug. Be careful who you hug. Turn, turn, your, turn your back to them. Oh, because I want them to see this. Give me a hug. <laughs> I'm used to that. <laughs> yeah. You better be careful who you embrace. They'll put a knife right in your back and you can't see it. You can't see it coming. That's where America is right now. We're embracing things and we're embracing religions that are going to be the downfall of America. And we embrace it. Oh, shouldn't we love everybody? Yes, I love everybody. But just because I love everybody doesn't mean I'm going to embrace what they are. It doesn't mean that I'm going to accept. Listen, there's only one way that somebody can go to heaven. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Please get that straight this morning. I'm not being any way. I'm not being ugly. I'm not being anti-anybody. In fact, if you really want to understand where I'm coming from, I'm for everybody. I'm for the Muslim. I'm for, I don't care who they are or what religion they are. Jesus died for them just like He died for me. But the only way... They're going to go to heaven. It's through the blood of Jesus. So I love them more than they love themselves. 
They're caught up in a religion that they're not going to go to heaven. They're going to go to hell. And I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to be saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. That's what I want. That's what You see, when we talk about Compassion Church, that's what it's all about. Jesus has the power to save anybody that wants to be saved. But I'm going to tell you something. If they don't want to be saved, if they want to continue in the nonsense that they're in, then I'm going to tell you something. we got a problem, friend. Do you understand that? I'm not going to embrace you. And I'm not going to embrace your religion. And I'm not going to embrace your God. And I'm going to do everything in my power as an American to make sure that you do not influence our society. Everything. What? You're preaching anti-hate. I'm not preaching hate. I'm preaching love. I love my kids. But you let them come home to my house with that nonsense. And how long do you think they're going to live in my house when they do that? How, how long do you think, if Connor comes home to my house and he says, Dad, I've been liberated. I've been enlightened. Tell me about it, son. I have found another way to heaven. Well, good luck. Pack your bags and get out my house. Because I will not have that nonfluence, that nonsense influencing my house, not another day. I will not bring that demonic activity into my life, into my house. It just will. And listen, by the way, it will not come in this house either. You understand that? That's not salvation. But I don't care what somebody is when they walk in there. If they are truly seeking a Savior, then we're going to give them Jesus high and lifted up and His glory and His train filling the temple. So when they are standing here with the devil all in their life, greater is He that's in me than he that is in them. And my Savior is able to deliver the sinner. Do you get what I'm trying to say to you? I'm trying to say... That, that if you are on usher duty and somebody comes in and you feel it's your space, to, your place to say, um, I'm not going to let you in. I will punch you. I'll, no. I, I've promised myself I'm going to quit the punching. Somebody, somebody keeps telling me how many times I talk about punching somebody in the face and killing people. I'm a violent person apparently. No, I'm not. Y'all know I'm really not going to... You know... Go on, Pastor. i got to finish. It's 12.02. I haven't even got into what I want to talk about. Salvation entails repentance. A sincere willingness to radically change our behavior. There is a certain de- de- degree of humility that is also required on our part in order to submit to Christ and to receive salvation. In the story of the jailer, Going back to this story, we are told that he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. That's what, that's what the power of God does. He fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He addressed them, as we said earlier, as sirs, using a term of respect and acknowledging the authority of Paul and Silas in Christ. In other words, the, the roles are now reversed, as we said that in the beginning. Now, that one was over, and now because of the power of God, he's under, and God is over. That's what salvation does. It reverses the roles. See, Believing on Jesus and what it's all about. I'm, are you already playing? Jesus, say, hey girl, you are good. You're playing the piano from, from your seat. I'm going to just stop until you figure out how to turn the thing on. I'm so sorry because I, I can only imagine what that's like to be sitting there and everybody in the church is just looking at you. Don't anybody turn and look at wherever that phone is. It's probably happened to you and if not, it will happen to you at some point. How many of you have cell phones? 
How many of you got them on right now? How many of you have been texting while I've been trying to preach? I just, I'm winding it down. Listen to this. Believe. What I got to do to be safe? Believe. The Greek word translated believe means to believe or to put one's faith in trust with the implication that actions based on that trust may follow. So it's not just believing, it's implying action follows. In other words, I believe, therefore I do something. There's a cause and effect. You get that? That's what salvation is. See, for some people, salvation is nothing more than a cause. And they say, how do you know you're saved? I'm saved because I don't do that anymore. (laughs) But what's the effect? Well, I don't do it anymore. Really? Now, this this is important. If you were lost and in darkness... And you're over here. And you come to the realization that that's wrong. And you, you just simply say, you know, I got I to gotta quit. I got to stop doing these drugs. And you can stand here and, and, and now because, because you can say, I'm saved. I'm saved what? I'm saved from drugs. I don't do drugs anymore. That's great. I've been clean for six months. I've been clean for a year. That's that's awesome. Yep. I'm saved. Hallelujah. I'm not a drug addict anymore. That doesn't mean that you are a Christian. That means you just don't do those things anymore. Well, I believe. Well, you got to understand the full effect here. What believe is all about. It implies something. Cause and effect. From to. See, when you come from something, it's important that you go to something. Do you understand? In other words, I replace one relationship with another relationship. Because if you don't replace that relationship with another relationship, the devil will send you another relationship. You see, if you have an addiction personality... If you don't replace that addiction with something else, it won't be long before you are trapped in another addiction. That makes sense to you? You see, I, I talk to people all the time, man, oh, he beat me, he did all these things to me, and thank God he delivered me from that. And six months later, they got somebody else beating them. Because they didn't change. They didn't change their personality. They didn't let God totally transform their life. You see, being free from something is free in something. And if I am not in Christ, then I am truly not free. For whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Do you get what I'm trying to say to you? you got to go from the sin to a Savior. Your love for this is no longer there. Now your love is totally consumed in Christ. You are no longer the same. But because of the blood of the Lamb that's been applied to your life, He is now your everything. You love Him. You love Him in the morning. You love Him in the afternoon. You love Him at night. When you wake up, He's all you're thinking about. And when you go to bed, He's all you're thinking about. The preacher doesn't have to do something to drag you to the church because you can't wait to get back to the church. You want to get in the presence of the people that love God because that now is your life. That used to be your life, but you have walked away from that. And now you are in Christ. In other words, here, there were no boundaries. You just did whatever you wanted to do. And if you don't walk in Christ and set some boundaries for your life, then you will walk away from it. Well, I don't think that's possible, Pastor. Well, I can give you Scripture after Scripture that tells you that it's possible. 
God, only to mention the personal example myself. But that's neither here nor there. It's all about a boundary. It's a boundary. In other words, because I was like a wild man out of, out of a cage doing anything that I wanted to do. The devil destroyed my life. But I felt a tug. And I turned. And I saw a Savior with his arms stretched open wide and nail, pinch, nail, nail marks in his hand. And I heard him say, I love you, Jay. I died for you that you don't have to live there. And I embraced him. And he embraced me with a total trust that he will never forsake me. He will never put a knife in my back. He's the only one that I can always trust that He's always going to be there for me. I love Jesus with all my heart. I love Jesus. I want to serve Him. I want to honor Him. I want to obey Him. I want Him to be Lord of my life. I don't want to be caught in the middle of a zone. You see, because just because I was in a relationship with somebody that was a bad relationship. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever had a bad relationship? Anybody ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a fiance that by the grace of God you were delivered? And now you look back and say, Hallelujah. Thank you for not lifting your hands. Being very sensitive. But just because you are out of that doesn't mean that you're in another one. Right? Being out of something doesn't put you in something. You see, I'm going I'm to close with this point. You see, I've seen so many people that had some horrible past in their lives and they, they stopped doing those things and they came out of those things and they can give you a testimony of what they used to be, and they're not that anymore. But yet, when you view their lives, you see that they're not in love with Jesus. They don't do bad things anymore. And they think because they don't do bad things anymore, and that they got a testimony of what they used to be, but they're, that, they're not that anymore. They think that they're saved, but yet Jesus is not Lord of their life, which means that their life is not centered around Him. Their life is self centered. You see, self-centeredness is what got them there to start with. And they're still self-centered. It's still me, 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 me. You see, here's the warning that I'm giving to you today, and I'm going to close this message. If you don't soon let Jesus be Lord of your life and totally sell out to Him, you are in danger this morning of going back to the very pit. Oh, I will never do that again. Well, it may not be that, but it'll be something. It'll be something. Because you have a personality that is centered around yourself. And the devil knows that. And he will send you something or someone who will drag you back to your vomit. Unless Jesus is your everything. I'll tell you something. Stand with me. When my eyes are set on Jesus... Devil, do whatever you want to do. You know, my eyesight's changed a great deal over the years. And, and one of the things that I'm beginning to lose in my eyesight is my peripheral vision. So I can tell you firsthand what this is like. My dad has this problem. So I can tell you what this is like. Things that I used to see over here, I don't see anymore. And because of that firsthand, I pray this prayer for the church and for Christians. God, help us to lose our peripheral vision. Because that's where the devil plays. He plays over here. So that when our eyes are in front of us, he goes over here and he dangles things. And we look. The most dangerous thing you can do when you're driving your car is keep your eyes or get your eyes off the road. 
I used to have a, I used to know some people that they would drive. Man, they were horrible drivers. Their cars would go just like this because they, uh, you know, I'm going to say it anyway. I know that the camera's running, but I, I love you, sis. Uh, I'm not going to call which one it is, but I had one sister that I used to hate riding with her because if she was driving and she'd look at the car go right on over there. She'd look over there at the car go over there. I'd pray, I pray, she was good for me. I prayed more than I ever should pray when I was riding with her. As some Christians that I know, their minds are not totally made up. And the devil dangles and they go over there. The devil dangles something over here and they go over there. They're up and they're down. They're in and they're out. Why are they in and out? Because they don't understand what salvation is all about. It's not just believing. It's acting on your belief and it's changing your life. Does everybody get the story? Please bow your head. Thanks again for watching this week's video sermon. Have a blessed week and we hope you will join us again next week.